performer who really needs no introduction, but her eclectic career has encompassed a wide range of entertainment media. She's acted in Hollywood blockbusters, off-road plays, TV sitcoms and indie films. She has fronted various bands, including Pulse Lama, an all-girl group that's represented in the Grace Current show. She's also, and there are many other images of Anne in the show. It's worth coming to see the just the show. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also written on innumerable publications <laughs> and presented her original performance art pieces at the Whitney Museum where she performed a five-hour tribute to Muzak in the museum's elevator. Um, and, am I correct? Oh, she's a picture. <laughs> yes, and I think it's in the slideshow, so keep an eye out for it as the slides go by. Um, I think you'll recognize the movie's elevator. And, um, and many other venues um, performances in her art at the Museum of Modern Art, Lincoln Center, BAM, LACMA, the Hammer Museum, Red Cat, the Walker Art Center, the Andy Warhol Museum, and others, and in places as far flung as Tokyo's Sojetsu Hall and Sweden's Ice Hotel in the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Carlo has been a great long-term friend of the Greys, at least since 2006, when he brilliantly curated our downtown show which was on view both at the break and here at Bill's <laughs> A popular culture critic and independent curator, Carla has written many books and catalogs on contemporary art and has taught at colleges and universities around the US. His writing has appeared in, and I love the range of these magazine titles, Aperture, Art in America, Art News, Art Forum, High Times, Spin, Vice, and countless other magazines. He's senior editor of Paper Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Annie Carlin. Uh, why don't you try to start that thing? Uh, we have two, just a little didactics on the, the images. We have two kind of PowerPoints. Try to put them together. They kept on Fritz, and but this is uh, this is stuff from Anne's archives, and I threw a few in until it glitched out on me. And then we have a great one, which is uh, Quang Chi's photos. It's a slideshow running in the gallery, which will get It's just eye candy. We're not going to talk about it, but just to say that. And then I really just want to talk with Anne. So cut to the chase a little bit. But if people want to ask any specific questions afterwards about any images, feel free. Cool. All right. So. Um, it seems to me if we're going to conjure Quang Chi and, and a bit of the time, a good place to start would be Club 57. And uh, just, I think probably everyone in the room knows, but just on the, on the most basic thing, it's, it's kind of a, a pretty outrageous club that actually operated as the youth group in the basement of a Polish church. So. I'm kind of a comic book fan, so I like origin stories. Can you tell us how something like that came to be? Well, it, it really came to be, let's see, if you go back, 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 <laughs> <laughs> CBGB's, <laughs> 1978, and I was a uh, theater student and doing my final uh, semester here of working at the Ensemble Studio Theater, but spending every night downtown, because it would be more interesting downtown. And I, was, I would go to CBGB's a lot, and I met Tom Scully and Susan Hannaford there. And uh, we hit it off, and we all liked the same things, and Tom and Susan uh, were interested in reviving vaudeville, and we talked about how Tony Pastor's vaudeville house was just down the street from CBGB's on the Bowery. And long story short, uh, they produced and I directed the New Wave Vaudeville show that was at the uh, at Urban Plaza, which was a Ukrainian <coughs> and Polish. It was really the, yeah, Ukrainian. Though. Ukrainian. 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 So um, we did that show twice, and Stanley Strakaki, Strakaki, I never have been able to pronounce his name. You should, you know, I should, was going to try to get in touch with Chris Kramsky to see if Stanley is. I don't think so. Someone told me that they had seen him three years ago. Stanley? Yes. I think it was Chris. Chris. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, Stanley was uh, working, Stanley and this guy, Alex, were working at the uh, Ukrainian Hall. Anyway, another long story short, they asked us to come to the small club 57, which was under the Polish National Church on St. Mark's Place, 57 St. Mark's Place, and to start uh, hosting events there. And I think that uh, Stanley, uh, Stanley had actually been doing events there and was uh, being helped by the guy, some of the people in the band, the Invaders. Uh, Gregor was one Gregor, of them. Yeah. Yes. So they had been doing some things at the small club, but they got a lot of flack from the neighborhood because of the sound and the noise. So uh, Stanley took to us and he wanted Tom originally to, to be the manager. Tom, I don't think, wanted all that responsibility, but Tom did want to have the show film nights, and he and Susan had the idea for the Monster Movie Club, which was every Tuesday, and then I, uh, and Tom suggested that I, I take the role as manager, and I was very eager to do that, so, uh, because I was insane, and a Capricorn, <laughs> and had way too much magnetic energy uh, that then got poured into the club. Tom and Susan did a lot of film nights, and they were involved in a lot of the events. And slowly, we built this this group of, uh, of characters, and <coughs> folks from the East Village, a lot of people from SBA, and uh, folks like Dane Johnson and Andy Wyland and April Palmieri and Deb O'Neill, and a lot of people are here tonight. And it became our clubhouse, and it really, it, it, ostensibly, we were operating as the <coughs> community of the Lower East Side to get around the the fact that the, they served alcohol. If it was a private membership, you could serve alcohol. But in a way, it truly was a youth group. But it, it was it was a great scam, and uh, I think I because I ended up in a later regime after we all left, and it was pretty much the last guy out the door. And, and what I can say is that Stanley really working with the church is that the money that was being made in the most nefarious ways. It's like this makes church bingo like seem yeah pretty easy, but. Maybe they were more nefarious yeah. during the last regime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty sketchy at the end. But the thing was, is what uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the money that they were making was actually going back to Poland to support the solidarity movement, which I think is really wild. They must have given them about what five dollars a night. Well, what I want. I do, sir. It was pretty, pretty bad. But uh, what I wanted to uh, ask you about, because part of what Guangxi opens up uh, at this moment is, is one, that's how great his gaze was and, and all the people involved. He captured a lot. Uh, but the other thing is like how this really kind of important, significant artist has has been kind of under underknown and undervalued uh, for a long time. So he's by example, and he shows you all these really beautiful freaks that were part of the scene. And it's, so it's not all Keith Haring and Jean Michel and Anne and Kenny Sharp. It's it's uh, they, so. Well, can you talk about some of the, yeah? Can you talk about some of the the people who are slipping through the cracks, like, let's do a little yes. historical retrieval here. Well, I should have brought the whole membership list. And <laughs> <laughs> Read it like a phone book. There was, you know, yes, and all the, all the addresses are all in the East Village, more or less. Oh my gosh, it was just such a great mix of, uh, it was students from SVA, it was locals, it was people who drifted in, who worked as dominatrixes, you know, but were the sweetest people <laughs> you could ever have met, and uh, there were, uh, folks from the, uh, there was a, these two guys uh, who would come only in drag named uh, Tina, Tammy and Tina. I don't think we ever knew what their real names were. <laughs> they always showed up as Tammy and Tina and they wanted to have a love-in. <laughs> so they had a Valentine's Day love-in. Um, wow, they're, uh, let's see. You know, well, it's you kind of hard. It's a, it was, well, John Sex is a pretty hard uh, character to, to convey to people now, and that he was doing that in the church basement was, that was pretty well, when he first, Well, when he was at SVA, he was John McLaughlin, and he didn't morph into John Sex until, well, pretty soon into the game, <laughs> but... <laughs> he's on the screen. Oh, well, he's... 
Yeah, yeah. I've done some later ephemera to attract people closer. I think a lot of people were also attracted by the, the uh, jukebox that Tom Scully yeah. uh, housed all of his 40. He had a great record collection, amazing taste. Super deep. Uh, any muso now would have just drooled at it. And um, But I think that's a, that offers a, a good way to talk about the aesthetics of, of what was going on there because there was a lot of people coming from different things, but... Sometimes the cops would just hang out there, or the firemen, <laughs> yeah. or some just people drifted in from the street and liked what was going on. Klaus Nomi, Joey Arias, was right. hanging out. Folks from the West Village, they kind of, there'd be a back and forth. Sometimes people from the Mud Club, I know we've talked about that there was a rivalry of sorts, but I think everybody went to all the different clubs. Uh, Snippy and Tish from Manic Panic, back there, they, they would show up and I enlisted them to host our Glitter Rock Ballroom Blitz night. And I was there at their uh, pop-up salon today. I really used to get my hair in you know. Thank you so much. In fact, when I, first, when I first came to the East Village, I passed by Manic Panic and they had a, that iconic poster of Farrah Fawcett. You know that one like that? And they had a paper bag over her head. I thought, oh my god, these are the coolest people. I have to know them. This is where I belong. I love this. And then later I got to meet them, and later we all did things like the Lady Wrestling Night. And, uh, yeah. So it was a whole. And the Lady Shop Celebrity. And Kwong Shi showed up early on, and he began. Uh, actually photographing events there, but he was in many of the events that, uh, there's actually some great photos that Lena Bertucci took of Kwong playing Carlton Varney in our 5700 Club, which was a Club 57 version of the Christian TV show, 5700 <laughs> Club. Uh, uh, yeah, and that's that's really interesting because, of course, uh, Kwong Chi did a really amazing body of work, which had kind of slipped my mind, but it's up in gray where he did a whole Portrait series of the moral majority. Uh, really, like all of them coming, you know, the young Buckley, all of them coming into power, the, the first wave of neocons. Yes, and, I remember when he went down there to do that. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, <coughs> that's sort of a lot of what's going on that is in the, sh in the shadows of, of basically a, a period of, of, you know, basically the entrenchment of Reaganism. And, yes, when, and, when Reagan uh, was elected, I think we all felt that this was truly the end of the world and that there would be nuclear war with Russia. So, party on. <laughs> <laughs> also, but, but also to create satirical work that was really uh, address that and, and us doing our own version of the Christian 700 Club was a way of doing that. Of, um, we dressed as the moral majority. I, I did Tammy Faye Baker, and we had the moral majority singers. <laughs> so at the PS1, there was a big event, and th there's photos at home. I remember you doing those. So all. us dressing up like yuppies and, and, and uh, the Christian right was some kind of strange shamanic uh, exorcism. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that whole situation with Reagan. I think just fueled our uh, desire to be other more, and, more than ever. And, and in this, like, as you say, a cold, uh, probably the last of the, of the Cold War anxiety, you know, kind of built up for generations. And as you said, maybe no, you know, this kind of, the punk was happening then with this idea of the no future. And then I think of it also, there was, uh, it was kind of a nostalgia for the future going on then. Like, I, I think of uh, Futura 2000, who showed right next door at, at 51X, like three doors away, or or, it, uh, or Kenny Scharf, uh, with his whole thing is like, I was promised this future with flying cars and the Jetsons and, and kind of trying to uh, bring, you know, recreate it. Well, it was clearly that that wasn't going to happen. Those daily shuttles by Pan Am to the moon were not happening. And I think it's interesting that, well, also I, I, for myself, and I know 
Kenny. Well, we also grew up watching the hippies and we watched the anti-war dissenters and the Barabin brothers burning their draft cards. And I, personally, that just excited me. I mean, I, I felt drawn to, to dissonance. And the, when the Chicago 7 would be on television and... Uh, yeah, Angel Days. Yeah, we were all pretty much in rapture for what we had just missed. And, but they mm -hmm. did let one know that there was an alternative, there were alternatives, and that the gay rights movement was starting to come into its own. I, I was very influenced by the, the spirit of the counter, I wanted to find the counterculture. Where are these people, you know? When we were kids, you'd see hippie, and you'd go, you know, in the back, you wanted to kind of go with them and do whatever they were doing, and when we got old enough, we certainly came to the only place where, A, you could live uh, on no money and not have to have a job, and B, do whatever you wanted, yeah. right? And, and Even if it was a dangerous, scuzzy that, place. That was the attraction of the neighborhood, for sure. <laughs> but, well, uh, but, uh, it's hard to remember. <laughs> but you said something to me the other day which struck me with, because concurrent with, with this kind of uh, quest and, and maybe the last you know, mythification going on, one of the last of uh, Bohemia and, uh, and that kind of subculture, uh, you talked about how everyone, this was really a generation where everyone had truly grown up on TV full time, the kind of like, this will rot your mind kids kind of generation. And the, so you said to me the other day that it allowed a kind of magical thinking amongst everyone. Oh, I think it programmed us to have magical thinking, to believe that anything was possible. You could say it was rotting your mind, but I think what's going on today is more of rot material. But there was all kinds of possibilities that were being presented, even though there were a lot of stereotypes that were also you know, still... The male gaze was quite, quite strong, but... Yeah, when I was a kid, I'd be good at movies, and you were in the movie. So I remember I was thinking about this because the screens are so small, and the screens used to be so huge. And my earliest memories of going to Swiss Family Robinson, or my parents would take us to the weirdest movies that were not appropriate for kids. <laughs> Cartoon. Was, my dad loved Zulu. You know these 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 war movies, and you're in it. You know, and I think as I grew up, I. My attraction to the theater was partly to uh, to be immersed in these environments where you could be other people and have these adventures, but not have to actually, you know, go to war or, or engage in, in dangerous things. They were again kind of shamanic rituals. So, and going to Disneyland was a huge influence as well. Because it's like you are in the TV, you are in that world. I hear it's Magical. been on acid. <laughs> I don't think I've been there on acid. <laughs> that would be too scary. <laughs> yeah. that would be way too scary. Uh, but but you did bring up this. But uh, when you're in, but Club yeah. Seven then became sort of this. And it was almost like you go down these stairs. It was subterranean. It was like a cave where you could create your cave drawings and your own rituals in there. And then we created, uh, my idea was that every night was a different channel on television and you could live that, you know, you could be that, uh, you could be, uh, be your own mediation. Sophia Loren and, and La Dolce, no, well, she wasn't La Dolce Vita, but you could be Anita Eckbert and La Dolce Vita one night and then the next night you could be an astronaut and the next night you could be, you know, a voodoo high priestess and the next night you could be a vampire and the next night you could be anything you wanted to be, and it was almost like an alternative Hollywood studio system, but using cardboard boxes that would drag out from the street. <laughs> so it's sad, and buying things at thrift stores for the costumes and the fantastic things you could get yeah. in the thrift stores. And Casbah, remember that place, Casbah, on the yeah, Second sure. Avenue? Mm -hmm. And I think that was one, Jim, wasn't that run by, you also had all these Warhol folks and people like Jackie Curtis who were, part of the scene and, and so we had their influence and I remember in college I got, our film teacher had us watch Death of the Organist, Please of the Organism and I thought, 
what, what, who's that? What's, what's going on there? Or Midnight Cowboy, you know, what, what, who are these people? They're so different. They're so magical. Mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of a combination of a clown and a, a witch doctors and the, the most exciting people at the neatest party you could ever go to. I want to go there. And there, there, was, there was there was kind of so much youth involved. Wouldn't you say that in some way that this magical thinking was also like a kind of really ruptures or, or raptures, even kind of uh, infantilism? You know, that, that basically it was like, it, it had that kind of wonder of childhood, of make-believe. And I, I always kind of thought it was like the first real teen kind of thing big thing in America were the Andy Hardy movies, right? Which okay. is Mickey Rooney and, and also a very young Judy Garland. But it always had that like, hey gang, we've got a barn in the backyard. Let's put on a show. We can save the farm and save the souls of the town in the meantime. Whatever. It'll be a musical and, and we'll do it with like cardboard boxes. So, did it have that to you? Oh yeah. And we were, I think we were doing it to save our own you know, Farm. I mean, the farm in your mind. To, 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 who wants to work a nine to five job? <laughs> just even today, walking around New York, I think, oh, God, I just hate to be in one of those buildings, like working there. Well, you know, I worked as a temp when I first came to New York. It was just absolute hell. I do anything to not have to do that. So and I'm sure they thought the same thing. <laughs> But it's just, uh, if you're drawn to the theater, if you're drawn to the arts, you're, you want to run away and, and with the circus. And then you don't have a very, uh, you know, the attention span is short, and <laughs> it needs novelty, and it needs a lot of excitement. And Which is why we're keeping the slides going. <laughs> <laughs> just while she was saying that, the uh, images of Keith Haring doing free paintings in the subway. You know, I mean, you can't take those down and sell them at a gallery. They're just temporary. But they did. Being. Did they really? Did they yes. chunk them right off yes. the wall? Yes. That's great. But, you know. Yeah, that's the other thing that was great about downtown, even though it was so uh, dangerous and scuzzy. Michael Stewart. It was, everything was possible as long as you didn't. I don't know, want to wear designer fashions. You made your own designer fashions. You found, I mean, all the cool stuff was in the thrift store, so it, it was, I felt there was a lot of economic freedom where you didn't have to be a slave to, and today, I guess, people have to work multiple jobs just to pay their rent. And uh, I remember Trey Spiegel, is he here today? I remember he, he, he was in 131 Avenue B. I was in 131 Avenue and he had just moved there. It was the Cristadora, right? No, no. Next. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. But he told me it was yeah, like, what he paid for rent. I'm like, oh my God. That's he crazy. said, then you just work harder. And I'm like, work harder? <laughs> 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 was, that was so anathema. Like, I mean, I worked really hard at what I loved doing, but to work in some office and to, like, what? And the, and I'd rather live in this hellhole for like $150 a month. <laughs> but you, got you did tell me before, like, the, the amount of energy you would expend on those things. Oh, it's it's kind of phenomenal now. It's like, I can't believe we do all that and we spent every penny we were given to do that and we wouldn't even turn it to like an HBO special or something. Like, now that you kind of, if you do a project, you, yeah. you, you monetize it in as many ways as possible. Right? Yes, it was so, so ephemeral, which was great. I mean, that, it had... Really, there was a period of time where I felt that it was, it was art for art's sake, and it was the reason to do it. I'll speak for myself, but maybe other people can chime in. It was just to be with these incredible people and live life and live in the moment and be here now. And it was kind of a hippie, hippie thing mixed with uh, the, but the punk rock fuck you. Yeah, and, and the punk rock DIY. I mean, I was also struck by, you know, what I it was putting together the PowerPoint with all this wonderful eph ephemera uh, Anne has, like the old layouts of the calendars and stuff. It just reminds you really what a like cut and paste DIY uh, cardboard boxes and Xerox machines kind of culture it was. Yeah, I love making those things. 
I just get a big, huge thing of coffee, right? <laughs> <laughs> and a big coffee at Ray's. Yeah. Remember the iced coffee was a book? <laughs> yeah, I drank so much coffee. And then a little bit too early in the evening, you decide to have a cocktail to like kind of mitigate the <laughs> I loved like, just cutting out those things. And I still like to cut and paste and collage. Collage is fun. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's the one thing that, you, that did exist, you know. Well, maybe those performances disappear after one, one night only. Those things were created for one night only. But to have some ephemera, and then thanks to Kong Chi and many other photographers like Andy and Andy Weiland and April Palmieri and others, we do have some documentation. And Kenny Sharp has fantastic video with a lot of the John Sex's first acts of live art. Yeah. And so he just did a show of those in, in LA, right? Yes. Uh -huh. So that must have been a trip to actually. And they all transferred it all and everything. He's done that all. Yeah. I gotta see that. And can I tell him? Oh yeah, about MoMA, right? You're good. There's going to be a show at. Um, come on, everyone here is probably on Facebook and they'll Next, it, but, well, we haven't uh, said anything. Oh, you have Next okay. year, there's going to be uh, a small. Well, who knows what it's going to be? Gallery show involving all this material, and to coincide with a um, a film program that we're so the films of Fifty Seven that we <coughs> curated by uh, Ron Magliozzi, and I helped a little bit, and Susan Hannaford some input, and John Epperson is the one who uh, first thought of the idea. So. Well, that would be great. I mean, movies were such a big part. Uh, you would do yes. nights of cartoons, and then all these B movies, and <coughs> kind of just Yes, and Tom and Susan going. really have to have, you know, be given the credit and for... Bob Carruthers also? There was that later? No, but Lisa Baumgartner, who had a, a zine called Bikini Girl, she had uh, movie nights, right. and she brought in uh, some very rare prints, and there was no video, of course, at the time. So she had a, she I guess had a friendship with Undine, who had a print of vinyl. <coughs> so I remember there was a show of vinyl and Chelsea Girls, and she showed quite. She was really a very, very hip woman. She passed away sadly <coughs> recently. She did a lot of stuff at Club Seven. She was part of the Ladies Auxiliary of the Lower East Side. And she was actually the one who would typeset all the print for me and then give me the sheets and then I'd cut them out and make the calendars out of them. Uh, but she was a huge influence on the club and the whole scene and I think of the culture. And uh, Bill Landis, who started Sleazeway Express, he, he did a lot quite of famously on, on most of the movies. He had a lot of films presented there. And Steve Brown, who was one of our members, and Barry Shills. They presented some films, and Andy Reese, who was also a manager of the club for a, a brief moment. Well, film was a pretty. He showed films. It was a pretty radical thing then. I mean, you had, you're concurrent with the uh, collabs. Uh, was it New Cinema on St. Mark's, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, and and Amos Poe and James Nares and John Lurie and Vivian Dick. They they showed their films there too. Uh, so it was a. Uh, the Muck the Club folks and the New Cinema folks, I mean, there was, those, the, the New Cinema people were a little too, a little, a little uh, too cool for school, we were like the total goofballs. So there was, like, a, there was a differentiation yeah. there, and yet, we went to the Mud Club, we'd go to films there, they, they'd show their films. It was cool versus goofy, but it was also, I think, it was people who took mushrooms versus people who took heroin, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was also people who liked to wear black and, and dress like a Godard film from 1959, and people who And you guys were all day glow. Not all day glow, but you know, a lot of Joey Heatherton and uh, Laugh-In, and uh, so, so a lot of that. I think some of that was also at the Mud Club. I think everybody in the downtown world was one community, and there were cliques like in high school. But there were at, early on, there were really only about 300 people who were in the scene. Right? <laughs> and you knew them, even if you didn't know them, you know where they were, and you could tell by the signifiers of the hair, the, the, the clothes. I mean, you might see bigger groups at some band at Urban Plaza. But for the most part, it was sort of this small coterie of people, and then that started to grow. Maybe when area opened, it started to get a little more 
the bankers and the, the Jay McInerney's showed up. <laughs> uh, you, you, you've told me you have a real problem with uh, the characterization of what you guys were doing uh, under the kind of idea of camp. Can you, can you explain why that bothers you so much? I just think it's used as a really uh, as a pejorative term, it's something from the outside applied rather than. I just think it's too easy. I, I did. I've complained about that to John Waters, so I think that we could all agree might be uh, the, <laughs> the premier, real deal, yeah. the premier uh, expert on what what is camp. He said, "Oh, you're not camp. Camp is all came in with." Tiffany Lamps and Betty Grable posters. <laughs> don't tell anybody that you don't like that because then that's all they'll say about you. Because if you know you hate it, that's what they'll say. Same advice. But I, I, I actually, I, I, I need to revisit Susan Sontag's Notes on Camp, and I will always wanted to write an essay called Notes on Notes on Camp. <laughs> so I think it's time to do that because I think it's of an era that becomes a convenient label. And I think it's labels that bug me. I really hate labels. I hate projections. And I think that was a big reason I came to downtown New York, because I want to get away the world, get away from the world that was labeled, that labeled you, and you had to be this, and you had to look like this, and you had to have this role, and you had to say these things. And even in the uptown theater world, even in the uptown, <laughs> especially oh, yeah. in the uptown theater world, and and the other thing is, like in theater, problem. you have to play a part, and you're like a robot over and over again. Downtown, when you could be in your own, you didn't have to pretend to be a rock star. You could be a rock star, or a movie star, or whatever, whatever, yeah, uh, or a ballerina. But uh, you, uh, <laughs> let's keep dreaming. Uh, you also have a similar problem with, with the kind of uh, people talking about queer culture coming out of that time, right? That, that's another late, that's one you just no. resist as a label, right? Well, yeah, I think it, uh, because uh, there was a, a grad student who recently had uh, done a thesis partially about Club 57 and the No Convention, and uh, there was another event, I can't remember, and I was reading part of her thesis, and it was, and there was a big chunk in there, and I thought, no, this is weird. This just does. Okay, you know what it was? Her advisor made her write all this stuff. The advisor had an idea of what Club 57 was, and it was connected to Keith Haring. Oh. And Keith, I love Keith, and Keith was a huge part of it, but he wasn't the only part yeah. of Club 57, and he wasn't the only part of that scene, and that scene had so many different flavors, different kinds of people, and I understand that queer, hey, I don't like queer, Love queer, but yeah. but it's again it becomes such a it becomes such a, a you narrow, like the word freaks, right? I like the word people. people yeah. <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah, I mean, good, maybe we don't need any. Do we need any? No, no, no. I no. guess what you do in academia, everything needs to be labeled That's as it, this yeah. and it's that. Academia. But what it does is that then people have this idea that the club was only young gay men, a lot of young gay men, of course, but it was only that, and it had it had a particular uh, agenda that had to be, you know, not that they were out recruiting people, not that kind of, I don't say the word agenda like uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> Sarah Palin would say. Okay. <laughs> but, then it, you know, Tom Scully wasn't gay, and he was a big part, he gets ignored a lot, Susan gets ignored a lot, and in the tapestry was so rich and varied and with so many different people in it and whether they were gay or straight, I I don't think that was really the point. Uh, you but had the freedom to be anything you wanted to be, but I, this might be a good time for me to read David McDermott's quotation that was in the East Village Eye that was actually in this girl's um, thesis. Uh, this was something that he was quoted in the East Village Eye, special sex issue, a short tirade on the commodification and assimilation of gay life. No one cares anymore if you're gay or not. We care about who you are. You gay culture fags have made a culture that can only be your culture. Well, Mr. and Ms. 
Mr. and Mr. Gay Culture Fags, you better redecorate and redo your hair. Lace and clothes because you're out, man. Real out. And we from the Lower East Side think you look dreadful. Just stay away from your disco and gay bars and mustaches instead of hair on your heads. Why do not you gay boys and girls be individual Americans with your own friends and neighbors and family instead of associating with that miserable band of slobs that all look alike? Nobody cares if you're queer or not anymore. So be yourself. Go punk and leave those tired queens to their own devices. Down gay. Up punk. <laughs> we love, and that's not to denigrate gay culture or queens or guys with mustaches or clones. <laughs> wonderful people, too. It's just that but once you crossed... Pretty much Astor Place, right? But the further east you got, he's, you didn't want to be. Well, there was a uniform, right? All black. And, uh, but there was also like the fags against facial hair, which Keith did art for and yes. stuff like that, and would say specifically clones go home. Or, and then I think I with think Pyramid. Want the freedom to be individual with Pyramid, in any form you know, that took. Yeah. Complete, a very libertarian. That's a, that might be a better term, libertarian. <laughs> Maybe not quite like the ones in Idaho, but maybe, maybe not that's that why she went and photographed Buckley. Mm -hmm. Should we allow? The, we don't have that much longer. Should we allow some questions? Oh gosh, I'm think? sorry. Oh, no, do you, no, 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 no. I'm just asking you. Or do you have things? Oh, you I want to read some more stuff. Why don't you? Do well, that? actually, I love this. Um, I finally been reading Luke Sante's Low Life, and there's yeah. a, a nice paragraph in the intro that I think really describes the whole vibe down there. But, you know, um, this book came about as a result of my having lived on the Lower East Side for more than a decade. I had gone there in pursuit of bohemian youth culture in addition to the fact that it was a cheap place to live. I slept and worked in crowds and tenements with sloping floors, crumbling plaster, corroded plumbing, erratic heating, looked out through barred windows at garbage-filled air shafts and decaying masonry. That's described my place. <laughs> but I was securely cocooned in marginality. I love that. Securely cocooned in marginality. The steam table food in Ukrainian coffee shops was cheap, and so were the old clothes and thrift stores. Discarded furniture was free. My monthly rent was roughly equivalent to my weekly wage, which was minimal. Relative material deprivation was not much of a sacrifice, considering that the payoff was independence from the social and cultural mainstream. At the time, New York was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was a buyer's market. Every other storefront in my neighborhood was abandoned. And most residual buildings, residential buildings that were not altogether derelict were only half occupied. The city seemed almost rustic in its quiet desolation, as conducive to meditation in its manner as the ruins of Greece and Rome, in a way that its isolation from the America of the suburbs and shopping malls mirrored my own frame of mind. And it also paradoxically seemed charged with possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think it was the, that the air was charged with possibilities and that you didn't have to be rich and you didn't have to be beautiful in a kind of an uptown concept. That's one way, reason I kind of hated Interview Magazine when they started, when you really started pandering to Reagan and, and, and wealthy people. And, uh, Can you talk about, I forgot, like, because it's amazing, you did all these great collaborations with a bunch anyway, was it Soho Weekly News, where oh, you yes. write text and it would kind of be these fashion spreads, was Kim part of that or something, or I don't know who was doing that there. Yes, but, I would go to Kim and Bronca, who ran the right, fashion uh, at, at Soho Weekly News, and I'd have an idea. The first one was, it's when I first met Quan Chi, he first started showing up mm. at the club, and I had all these long uh, ball gowns or dresses from the 60s or the 50s that I've been collecting from thrift stores and I wanted to do like a fake bow magazine spread on these, uh, these long evening gowns that I had names for. One was called the Poseidon Adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all awkward. And, uh, and, uh, and I'd seen Kwong's work and I went, oh my god, he's got to be a photographer. So uh, that was our first collaboration. And, and then we did several things together. And, and some were kind of, you know, not just making fun of glamour, we're really making fun of, like, kind of middle America, right? Weren't they well, like it's the, the a Reagan sons? world. Well, when Reagan yeah. got uh, elected, we went to, uh, I had, a, I, the idea I had was that to have us all dressed up like yuppies 
and I collected these old architecture books of 60s split level houses, and then we would all be in front of these houses dressed like yuppies. And Jack Smith was one of them, and he, uh, him and Stacy Elkin were playing. He, I, I said everybody, well, I had names for everybody, but I asked if Jack wanted his own name. So like, oh, I have my own name. I said, sure, what? Sinbad Glick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but Quan Chi then had the idea we would go, I don't know how we would, we would, it's hard to know who came up with what, but it all became a collaboration. We went to Danceteria, the opening, the first opening of Danceteria was on 20, the first one. 36. 36 37. Was that when? Yeah. Okay, Jim Farrell, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, we, uh, I went to, uh, I interviewed, I was the uh, interviewer, the intrepid reporter, asking people what they thought about Reagan and Huang Shi had an assistant, probably Christopher, who held an uh, American flag behind everybody and took pictures of us. And Jackie Curtis was one of the folks, and uh, Carmel Johnson, and uh, Steve Brown. I remember Steve Brown's quote, it was like, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing. It has a lot to do with the opening of Peppermint Lounge. It was Peppermint Lounge. <laughs> oh, Peppermint Lounge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there were, and then Kwong got all these assignments from uh, Japanese magazines, so he would involve us in that. And then when I started writing for Condé Nast Traveler, um, uh, the first assignment was to go to Death Valley. So after I had gone for the to, do the reporting, and then we went back to do all the photos and home shoots of all that. So we had a lot of great adventures. But I want to mention one thing about parodies. Uh, when I did Vulcan Death Group, it began as a satire, and five minutes into the rehearsal, the parody ended. And we were a heavy metal band, and it was so fun to be a heavy metal band. But under our own with the, our own parameters and rules. And I think it was the same with a lot of these events. They started off as, like, yes, social satire, but then there was, I still haven't gotten to the root of it, and I'm, I'm writing about it and trying to get articulate this better. And since I've been studying a lot of Carl Jung and uh, taking his classes online, this fantastic psycholo uh, clinical psychologist named Jordan Peterson, who is online on YouTube and his stuff, is, his lectures are great. And I think there was a deeper, more primal, union thing at work Right. So all this. And this is maybe a way out of a camp for your, your future notes on notes on camp. But yes, it, that when you talk about parody, I think that everyone had a great affection and love for the material they were spoofing on, especially the old Americana that you guys were yeah. riffing on. I, so it, maybe that this parody exists at a moment before youth culture adopted the language of irony. Is that a, is that a good way to think of it, Anne? Huh. Uh, well, I think we were probably responsible for making it. <laughs> uh, I think the irony thing was pretty firm. And, but it wasn't the only element. And that's my beef with calling it a, exclusively a, gay, a, a, a queer culture, although I know that encompasses everybody who's outside of the status quo. Can you talk but about but it just wasn't just these things. It was this, it was that and so much more. It was that and so much more. So outside yes, it. Elements it was outside of, of. Yes, elements of queer. But how about the matriarchy of, aspect to it? Because I think there's something, you know, <laughs> there's something really powerful there and you don't see it so much. It's like there's yes, the yes. ladies auxiliary, the Lower East Side. It's Paul Salama, an all-female group. It's yes. pretty fierce. That's something that actually was in somebody else was, I was talking to about that, was that that was another appeal of downtown. You had Patti Smith, you had uh, Ellen Stewart at La Mama, you had women who were, uh, Lydia Lunch certainly was a, a massive, uh, Cynthia Slay and Pat Place and mm -hmm. women of uh, Bush Tetris, and uh, Snooki and Tish from Manic Panic, the entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And certainly where I worked at this theater, I was the assistant to the artistic manager. It was such a patriarchal. I mean, I got to hear what they'd say about actors, you know, when they left, and it was just hideous. It was like, fuck this, I'm not going to be an actor. I'm going to be, uh, you know, a shaman or something. 
It was something that's bigger than that. This, you know, they, that was just all about putting people in, in, in boxes and, and so many limitations. And that's what I like about this Luke Sante quote. It's, it's, the world of downtown was a world of infinite possibilities. It was like Disneyland, but with crabs. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, do we have time for questions? Yes. Okay, let's do if any if anyone has quicker questions rather than really long ones. Go ahead. Uh, I hope that there is a conversation about camp that Fails puts on because I think it's a very interesting conversation and parody. But you know, and we're looking we're listening to you and everybody's here who's still alive, who's around, you know. It's like a wonderful gathering in this room. But we're looking at all these people that died oh, yeah. in the screen. And, and AIDS and the impact of AIDS and also the gallery scene in the Lower East Side, Gracie Mansion, et cetera, and the impact of AIDS and that, how that all... Oh, yeah. Can you talk just a little oh, bit about that? Yes, I meant that. I think all of us that looked at that, I think that's something that we're going to have to look at and I think the beginning, the urgency, the sense of urgency, and this need to create like this feverish pace was youth, and also perhaps a fear of or sense that we were not did not have much time because of this Reagan nuclear holocaust. Just the environment was so dangerous; you really could get killed. Um, the heroin people certainly died. From heroin. Michael Stewart. What? And Michael Stewart getting. Oh yes, the cops. And so it was a very, very dangerous. Uh, volatile environment. And, uh, I think maybe that might have been one of the reasons to be, to have created a world of color, a wonderful world of color within these this this dreary and dark environment. But when AIDS began, I think it fueled that sense of urgency and then you really did think you were gonna die. So there's so many that's such a huge complicated there's so much to be said about that. And all the people who died, I mean, that was like being in a war. That was like World War I, being in the trenches and watching your, your friends, mm -hmm. to, you know, just blow up next to you. It's mm -hmm. one of the reasons you left New York, isn't it? No, no. No? no. It was just real estate? <laughs> Movie star. No, I didn't know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in West Virginia. I grew up around a lot of trees and green and open skies. And when I you know, there was the, the ability to live with a backyard and orange trees and sunshine. And I lived, my apartment in Avenue A looked out on an air shaft, very much described like Luke Sante. I had been there for many, many years. I didn't like living like that. And, and there were possibilities. And for you me. found a hunk. I found somebody that I liked to have sex with. <laughs> and, uh, and then there was also um, there were there were more possibilities in the world of acting, and I needed to make some money. I mean, we, we could glamorize or we could romanticize poverty, but it's it gets to be a bit of a bore after a while. I mean, there was one time around then when yeah, it was before I moved out there that I was the cat was meowing for food in the middle of the night, and I didn't turn on the lights. I just grabbed the Purina cat chow, and I poured out. You know, I was trying to find the bowl, and I clicked on the light as I was pouring it, and I out came hundreds of cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> I poured the cat a big bowl of cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> I just screamed. Just on the floor, and I just started sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> but I absolutely did not go there because I was running away from here. I kept coming back and forth for until 2003, and I came back to be with my friends and to, and my brother had AIDS, and I wasn't supposed to tell anybody. And he was in a lot of secrecy, and I had a lot of friends who did not want uh, people to know they were HIV positive, and there was tremendous fear. I didn't know. I thought, well, there's no reason I shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. I've slept with people who are. And when I found out that I was, the doctor said that I had the most neutral reaction because I just couldn't believe it. I just thought, why be, you know, I should, why should I be spared? It's not fair. 
Talk about Bambada. Talk about Bambada at 57, just to bring it up back for a moment. You know, one of the posters. He had an art show, the whole down, the Day Glow art show, I think. So he brought a lot of the uh, hip hop guys, an African Bambada DJ, and had by Freddie, who who was a regular at Club 57. He was part of that show, the feature. Keith really was was the one who brought in. Yeah. And that was just to just to get it factually correct. Was did Steve Mass kind of hire him away from Club Fifty Seven to get to to work there, basically? And also, and and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All of us. I mean, yeah. I mean, no, no, no. we we you know, but we didn't go away from Club Fifty Seven. We just <laughs> we were going to my club anyway. Yeah. yeah. There's a book uh, that fellow named Tim Lawrence is writing now. It's almost finished, I guess. Finished. About club culture. And uh, I know he gets into a lot of those details, and that clarifies a lot of this <coughs> about this, all that back and forth between the clubs. But yeah, Steve Bass came to Club 57. He liked it. I think he was quoted in Esquire magazine saying it was his favorite club. I know Susan Hannaford didn't want to work for him, but she ended up working as a coach act, but wouldn't get wouldn't do any events for him because she held out. <laughs> but you know we all needed money. I mean you can live on very little, but you can't live on Yes. And you know what? He gave us a lot of freedom to do everything we wanted to do. So 